I am a girl, and a few years ago, something really scary happened to me because of Facebook. At that time, I had just finished high school. It was summer, and I was living with my mom and dad. I used Facebook sometimes, but not as much as other apps like Snapchat or Instagram. My Facebook and Instagram were connected, so my Instagram posts would also show up on Facebook. I remember not checking Facebook for many weeks. I had turned off notifications because I didn't like getting random messages from Facebook that didn't matter to me, like someone's birthday or similar things. When I finally opened Facebook after a long time, I saw I had missed many notifications. First, there were about five friend requests. I also noticed that my Instagram pictures had been shared on Facebook, getting lots of likes and some comments from friends. I replied to some comments and accepted the friend requests. But then I saw a comment from a man I didn't know. His comment on one of my photos was weird and creepy. He said something like, You're so beautiful. I wish you were mine. It made me feel uncomfortable, especially because the man looked a lot older than me. He had white hair tied back, a bit of a beard, and glasses. I noticed he commented on my other photos too, and those comments were just as unsettling. He even commented on very old posts from years back. When I checked his profile, I realized he wasn't on my friends list, and I didn't remember getting a friend request from him. I deleted all his comments and blocked him. Then I changed my profile settings so only friends could see my information and posts. I felt safer after doing this and thought that would be the last of it. But I was wrong. Just two days later, I was alone at home. My parents were at work, and someone knocked on our front door. I walked to the living room slowly and peeked out the front window. I thought it would be a delivery guy like UPS or Amazon at the door, but instead, there was a man I didn't expect to see. It was the same man who had left creepy comments on my Facebook photos. I was shocked. I had assumed this man lived far away, possibly on the other side of the country. As I watched him from the safety of my living room, he turned his head and saw me. Our eyes met for a second before I turned and ran to my room. I quickly called my mom, my voice shaking as I explained the situation. While talking to her, the man knocked on the door again. My mom advised me to call the police if he didn't leave. I peeked out from my room, listening for any sign of him. Hearing nothing, I crept towards the living room, moving as quietly as I could. But as soon as I entered, I saw him outside the front window, staring in. He noticed me, smiled in a way that sent chills down my spine, and waved. Terrified, I ran back to my room and dialed the police, reporting a stalker outside my house. The operator promised that officers would arrive within five to ten minutes. Feeling somewhat safer, I waited, listening for any noise that would indicate he was still there. A couple of minutes passed, and just as I considered checking again, a knock sounded on my bedroom window. I froze, then slowly turned to see him peering in at me. I screamed and fled to the bathroom, locking myself in. I stayed there until I heard a different knock and a voice announcing police at the front door. Cautiously, I left the bathroom and went to let them in. They told me they had caught the man trying to enter through the back door. He was arrested, and I felt a wave of relief wash over me, knowing I wouldn't have to deal with him again. Last year, I badly needed a new laptop. Every day, I used a computer for school and sometimes for work too. It was something very important for my day-to-day -day life. The laptop I owned was old and very slow. I had been saving money for a long time to get a new one. My brother told me to check out Facebook Marketplace, so one night I did just that and looked for laptops. I wanted one that was newer and stronger. After days of looking and doing lots of research, I found one that looked like a great deal. I checked it quickly again and decided it was the right choice for me. Then I messaged the person selling it. The seller got back to me fast. His name was Jack. When I talked to him, he said we could meet the next day in the afternoon, after his work. I told him I was ready to buy the laptop then. As long as it worked well, I would pay him the full price he wanted, which was $800 in cash. I knew this was a lot cheaper than its price in stores, and I thought I was getting a great deal. Jack agreed it was okay, and we planned to meet the next day after his work. There was a small shopping center in my town, and we chose to meet in its parking lot in a quieter spot. It was a place that usually had a lot of people, but we picked a corner of the parking lot that was more silent. 
My brother decided to come with me so I wasn't by myself, and we drove there right on time at two in the afternoon. I think we arrived a bit early, then we waited. I had told Jack when I was leaving, and he said he was on his way too. When he wasn't there yet, I thought he was just delayed or held up at work. My brother and I stayed in the car, talking while we waited. Time passed, and we began to worry. No one was around us in the quiet part of the parking lot where we planned to meet, and Jack was now over ten minutes late. I messaged Jack, telling him exactly where we were and asked him where he was. We kept waiting, but he didn't reply. Soon, it was almost thirty minutes after we were supposed to meet. Then, I saw that Jack had seen my message, but he didn't answer. Feeling let down, my brother and I decided to leave. My brother guessed maybe Jack realized the laptop was worth more than he asked for, or something like that. We drove back to our house, where we lived with our parents while away from school. Our parents were at work so it was just the two of us there. But After getting home, I looked on Facebook Marketplace again, but it seemed like Jack had blocked me, and everything was gone. This made me really upset. After that, I started looking for other laptops, trying to start over. I was in my room when suddenly my brother rushed in. He said he heard a noise from the back window, and then saw a man outside. We went out to check, and just as we did, we heard our back door opening. It was only three o'clock, and our parents usually didn't come home until after five, but we were sure it was probably the man my brother saw. We both dashed back into my room and quickly closed the door behind us. We pressed our ears against the door to listen closely. Someone was definitely moving inside our house. My room was at the very end of the hallway, and the person didn't sound too far away. I whispered to my brother, asking him what we should do next. He whispered back that he was going to call the police and took out his phone. But just then, we heard the footsteps coming our way. We tried to be as silent as possible. My brother hadn't managed to dial the police yet because we were scared to make any sound. The stranger slowly walked through the hallway, then into one of the rooms. My brother whispered to me, thinking the person had gone into his room. That's when I thought of something. I whispered urgently that we needed to escape, pointing towards my window. I rushed to it, trying my best to open it quietly. Our house was only one story, so if we could get out, we could run for help. As I opened the window, it made a loud noise. Right at that moment, we heard the person leave my brother's room and start moving down the hall towards mine. I quickly climbed out the window, and my brother followed. Just as he was getting out, I heard my bedroom door swing open. We didn't look back. We ran straight to our neighbor's house across the street. We knew them well and figured it was safe. Thankfully, they were home. We hid in their garage and called the police from there. When the police arrived, the man was still inside our house, hiding in the basement. It turned out to be the same man, Brian, who was supposed to sell me the laptop. He had actually been in the parking lot of the shopping center at the same time as us, just blending in with the other parked cars. Then, he followed us home without us noticing, and tried to break in, probably aiming for the cash I was carrying for the laptop. That's the only reason I could think of for his actions. After this incident, I decided never to use Facebook Marketplace again. I am a 32-year-old man, and I live in the north part of America. This tale is about a frightening experience I had last summer, and it still makes my heart race when I recall it. After my friend left our shared flat, I was stuck with an empty room. Paying the rent alone was too much for me. I had seen people finding roommates on Facebook so I thought I'd try it too. I put up a post showing the room and wrote a simple description of our place, then I shared it. It didn't take long before people started replying. The first message was from a man named Mark, who said he was interested. He seemed okay, but his way of talking was off. His voice didn't show any feeling, like a machine. I tried not to worry too much. Not everyone is good at talking on the phone. I suggested we meet somewhere public to chat first. But he didn't want to meet and said he preferred to move in straight away. That made me feel very uncomfortable, so I decided to look for someone else. Then he sent me a very angry text with mean words and even threats. What happened next was even more terrifying. 
he sent me a photo of a dark gun on a table. I couldn't tell if the gun was really his, or just a picture to scare me. I blocked him and tried to sleep that night. A couple of days later, another message came in, this time from a guy named Alex. He was polite, and we sent a few texts back and forth. Then he suggested we meet at a local cafe to talk about the room. I agreed to meet him at a small cafe in the center of town. When I got there I saw a man sitting by himself, looking around as if he was expecting someone. I approached him and introduced myself. It turned out to be Alex, so I sat down and we started to chat. He talked about where he worked and what he liked to do for fun. He seemed like a regular guy, and I began to relax a bit about the situation. But then, as we talked more, I noticed his voice sounded very familiar. It was the same flat emotionless voice that Mark had on the phone. This made me feel uneasy, thinking that Alex might actually be Mark trying to trick me. So I quickly made up a reason to leave, grabbed my stuff and stood up. But as I was about to walk away, Alex grabbed my arm tightly and said, You won't get away from me that easily. Fear gripped me and I started to panic, but then I remembered I had my phone in my pocket. I managed to get it out with my free hand and called the emergency number. Seeing this, he let go of my arm, and I ran out of the cafe. I stayed on the phone with the operator until the police arrived. Alex was arrested on the spot, and I was left shaking but thankful I was safe. Upon searching him, the police found a gun that looked just like the one Mark had sent me a picture of. I shudder to think what could have happened if I had let him into my home. Thankfully, that never happened, and I escaped the situation unharmed. I still can't understand why he did what he did. Eventually, I found a new roommate through friends, which I believe is much safer than meeting someone online. That's the advice I'd give to anyone now. One day, I checked my account and saw a new message from someone. I often used Facebook for many years. During all this time on Facebook, I got lots of friend requests. I didn't really know most people in my friend list. Usually I got around 5, 10 friend requests every week, and I mostly accepted them without thinking much. The message I got this time seemed like junk. It was just a bunch of links, and these links were super long. There wasn't any text with these links, and I didn't click on them. They were sent by a person who didn't have a profile picture. I thought this person was just sending spam, and maybe I had added him by mistake before. I deleted the message and removed him from my friends. But the next day I got a very similar message. It was from a different person. This one had a profile picture, but it was nothing special. I think it was a sports team's logo. This person also sent me random links. Now I started to think maybe there was a problem with Facebook, and that's why I was getting these spam messages. I just deleted them and didn't think much about it but the messages didn't stop. The next day I got spam from several different accounts. I was starting to wonder what was happening. Then the day after that, things got really strange and scary. I received a friend request and the username was John Doe Hates. John Doe is actually my name, and I also got a friend request from someone named John Doe is a Fool. I clicked on these profiles, curious despite myself. They were empty. No friends or posts, like they were made just to scare me. Someone was clearly trying to scare me. I didn't know who it was or why they would do this. I quickly decided not to accept those strange friend requests and took a break from Facebook. I even deleted the app from my phone and didn't check it on my computer. But the weird stuff didn't stop with Facebook. A couple of days were quiet, but then, one night around midnight, there was a knock on my door. Living alone in a small apartment, I was puzzled about who could be visiting so late. I went to the door, but when I looked through the peephole, nobody was there. The same thing happened the next night. A knock, but no one at the door when I checked. The following morning, I found something even more disturbing. Right outside my door, there was a piece of paper lying on the ground. It was a printout of my Facebook profile picture. This scared me more than the knocks. I had no idea what I should do. The final straw came the next night. It was around 11 p.m., and I was getting ready for bed when I heard another knock at my door. This time, right after the knock, I heard the sound of the doorknob turning. My heart raced. Thankfully, my door was locked. I rushed to see who was there, but again, nobody was outside. 
I opened the door cautiously, and what I saw made my stomach turn. There were over a hundred pieces of paper with my profile picture printed on them, all piled up on the floor. I gathered them up and decided it was time to go to the police. I explained everything to the police the next day and filed a report. There wasn't much else I could do. Strangely enough, after I went to the police, everything stopped. No more knocks, no more pictures left outside my door, and no more creepy Facebook messages or friend requests. I still have no idea who was behind it all. This story starts a few years back, in 2018. I was really into using Facebook then, not so much these days. Every day I'd scroll through Facebook on my phone and chat with friends using Messenger. At the time, I was 20 years old and had around 300 friends there, which felt like a lot, even though I knew some people had thousands. One day, I received a friend request from a girl named Lily. We had a few friends in common, about four, and from her profile photo, she seemed friendly. Her profile didn't have much info, just her age, 20, and a couple of photos, showing she had around 150 friends. I didn't recognize her, but since we had mutual friends from my old school, and another person I didn't know well but who lived nearby, I accepted her friend request. Shortly after, Lily messaged me. I opened Messenger and we started chatting. She was easy to talk to and we quickly became friends. After chatting for a week, we decided to meet in person. I knew she lived close by but didn't know her exact address. Lily suggested we meet at a shopping mall close to my place, about a 15 minute drive away. We planned to meet there on Saturday at noon. We kept chatting as usual until then. When Saturday came, I drove to the mall and entered. It was crowded, typical for a weekend. I let Lily know I was on my way, and she said she was too. Upon arriving, I messaged her I was inside, but then she stopped answering. At first, she said she was already in the mall looking for me, but after I told her my exact location, she went silent. I waited in the food court for about 15 minutes, but no sign of her. I messaged her again, noticing she had seen my message but didn't reply. After waiting a bit more without any sign of her, I started to feel uneasy and began walking around the mall to find her, thinking maybe her phone signal was bad, or she was too busy to reply. But as I wandered through the crowded mall, a sinking feeling grew inside me. The mall was large, and finding someone in it was like looking for a needle in a haystack. The mall wasn't huge, but it was big enough with two floors and lots of shops. It was filled with people, making it hard but not impossible to find someone. While searching, I noticed a man staring at me from a distance. As I moved through the mall, I saw him again, trailing behind me. I wandered for about half an hour, hoping to meet Lily, but deep down, I started feeling she might not actually be there. Then my phone buzzed. It was a message from Lily saying, meet me at the food court entrance. I was puzzled because I had already been there and told her so. I headed back, taking a few minutes to get there. The place was still packed, but there was no sign of Lily. Approaching the entrance, I spotted the man I had seen earlier. He was loitering near the doors, scanning the crowd. Our eyes met briefly before he hid behind a door. Feeling uneasy, I decided to leave, but chose a different exit to avoid him. As I walked away, he started following me through the food court. I quickened my pace, turned a corner, and finally reached an exit. Once outside, I circled the mall to get to my car without seeing the man again, and drove home. At home, I found another message from Lily. Why didn't you come to the food court entrance as I asked? Why did you leave? By then, it was clear to me that Lily might not be real, and that the man could be behind her account. I challenged her to send a real-time photo of herself. Instead, she blocked me. This confirmed my doubts. I was disappointed, but relieved I hadn't fallen into a worse situation. This experience taught me to be much more cautious with people I meet online. The thought of being watched and followed in the mall by someone with bad intentions was chilling. From then on, I made sure to verify the identity of anyone I planned to meet from the internet. I was bored, just looking through what my friends shared and checking out news online. I felt like checking something new, so I decided to look at the buy and sell section to see if there was anything interesting for sale. Once, I had bought a phone from an online marketplace, and it was a good deal, so I thought why not see what's available now? There were the usual things. Cars, phones, 
computers, and some other stuff no one really needs. Then, my eyes caught an ad for a free television. This TV seemed pretty new, and I was actually thinking about getting one for my room, so I clicked on the ad to learn more. I wanted to find out if there was something wrong with the TV, which made it free, or if it was in perfect condition. The ad showed it was a 50-inch TV. The photo showed it standing in a room with carpet, and there was a photo of it turned on, proving it worked. The seller, now called Anna, mentioned she was moving and didn't want to take the TV with her, but assured it worked perfectly. The ad had been posted just an hour ago. I quickly sent a message asking if the TV was still there, and said I could come get it as soon as she allowed. About 10 minutes later, Anna replied, saying the TV was available and I could pick it up the next night. We agreed on 8 p.m. I was thrilled about the TV, thinking it was worth a lot, and I had been wanting one anyway. The following day I sent a message to Anna to make sure everything was still okay, and she said to just message her when I arrived, and she would open the door for me. I spent my day at work, went home for a bit, and then set off to pick up the TV from Anna's place. Anna's message earlier had been friendly, making me feel at ease. I typed her address into my phone and followed the map. It was a short drive, only about 10 to 15 minutes from my place. The neighborhood looked normal, a bit removed from the hustle of the city, with houses spread out, each sitting on a decent-sized piece of land. Then, I turned onto a street ending in a dead-end sign. This was it. The road ended at a narrow driveway, which my phone told me was Anna's. The driveway led to a garage separate from the house, with an old pickup truck parked out front. I drove down the driveway, thinking it would be easier to load the TV. After parking, I quickly messaged Anna to let her know I had arrived. She replied right away, inviting me to come in and mentioning the TV was in the living room, waiting. Stepping out of my car, I noticed how dark it was, with no lights on in the house. It felt odd, but I shrugged it off and walked to the front door, finding it unlocked. Inside, it was pitch black. I fumbled for a light switch, eventually using my phone's flashlight to find one. The light that came on was weak, barely illuminating the old dusty living room. No TV in sight. Feeling uneasy, I moved further inside, exploring a bit. There was a kitchen that looked normal enough, a hallway leading to the back, another living area, and stairs going up and down. The TV was nowhere. The house's quiet and eerie vibe was getting to me. I messaged Anna again, asking about the TV and double-checking the address. Waiting for her reply, the silence of the house felt heavy, making me want to leave. Then, Anna's message came through. She confirmed the address was right and added, Sorry, I'm at the upstairs living area. When Anna told me to take the stairs in the living room, I felt something was off. Why didn't she meet me herself? Why wait until now to tell me to come upstairs? Despite my doubts, I moved towards the stairs. Just then, I heard footsteps outside, heading to the front door. The screen door opened, and then the front door, which I hadn't closed properly, was shut. I caught a glimpse of an arm. It looked like a man's, but not the person attached to it. Right after that, I heard someone coming up from the basement. I didn't head upstairs. Instead, I made my way to the back of the house feeling a chill run down my spine. Seeing the back door, I didn't hesitate. I ran out into the night. The backyard was wild, with tall grass and trees. I ran through, eventually finding myself in the neighbor's yards, making my way back to the street while avoiding the house. From a safe distance, I could see my car still in Anna's driveway. My heart sank. I knew I had to get back to it. Checking my phone, I saw several messages from Anna, urging me to come back questioning why I left. Ignoring the dread, I made my way back to my car as quietly as possible. Reaching the driveway, everything seemed eerily quiet. I sprinted to my car only to find the windshield smashed, glass everywhere. As I drove away, a quick glance at the house revealed a man watching me from a window, an unsettling smile on his face. Back home, I reported the incident and the account named Anna. I couldn't shake the feeling that Anna might have been a cover for the man in the house part of some dangerous trap. What exactly was happening in that house remains a mystery, but one thing was clear. I was lucky to escape unharmed.
A few years back, I decided to sell my old car through Facebook Marketplace. I had just gotten a new job, and with it, a new car, so it felt like the right time to let the old one go. Before, I usually bought and sold cars on Craigslist, but this time, based on a friend's suggestion, I chose Facebook Marketplace because it seemed simpler. The car I was selling was a 2014 Chevy Cruze. I wanted $8,000 for it, which I thought was a fair price after checking around. I expected some people to offer less than what I asked, and I was okay with that, as long as it wasn't too much less. At first, not many people seemed interested. Only one person asked if the car was still up for grabs, but then they disappeared after I said yes. Another person offered me just $1,000, which was way too low. I ignored them, but they kept messaging me, begging me to at least consider their offer. In the end, I had to block them because they were wasting my time. After a couple of days with no real interest, I finally got a message from someone serious. A guy named Dave contacted me, saying he'd pay the full $8,000 and wanted to see the car that very night. I was really happy about this and agreed to meet him. We decided to meet in the back of a Walmart parking lot that night. I cleaned the car, hoping to sell it. Dave told me he was on his way and soon after, I saw an old black car pull up next to mine. A man got out introducing himself as Dave. He was a skinny guy, about 5'9", wearing old jeans and a hoodie, and he looked to be in his 30s. He said he liked the car and was ready to buy it right away. Dave agreed to take the car for a test drive. He sat in the driver's seat and I took the passengers. We drove around the block and then Dave parked the car back in the Walmart lot. He seemed happy with it and told me he'd buy it, saying he had the cash in his car. It was chilly, so when he suggested we sit in his car to stay warm while he got the money, I agreed. Inside his car, Dave reached into the side compartment of his door and pulled out a big bunch of cash. But when he handed it to me, it was only $1.800. I thought he was joking at first, but his face was dead serious. Then he confessed he had messaged me before with a different account, offering $1,000. He was desperate for my car and said I could either take the $1.800 or he'd take the car himself. That's when I realized he still had my car keys. I argued, saying I needed at least $7,000, but Dave wouldn't budge from his $800 offer. When I asked for my keys back, he ignored me, locked the doors, put his car in drive, and started moving. He warned me not to try anything, claiming he was dangerous, and then drove onto the freeway, demanding my phone with threats of driving into oncoming traffic. I had no choice but to give it to him. Eventually, he exited the freeway, drove down a deserted road, and ordered me out of the car. Left alone without my phone or car keys, I walked in the cold until I found a small gas station where I could call the police. They took me back to the Walmart, but my car was gone. I reported everything and got a ride home. My car was never found, but thankfully I had insurance. I just hoped the police would catch that guy. My name is Jack, and this scary thing happened to me a few years back when I was still in college. Back then, I was in my third year, learning how to run businesses. I had spent my first two college years at a small college and had just moved to a bigger university. I was both excited and nervous as I packed up my things to go to my new place. I was going to live with some people I didn't know yet who I found through a Facebook group. I didn't really know much about them before I got there, and living alone was too expensive for me. But when I got to the house, I liked it right away. It was an old but charming house close to campus. It wasn't fancy, but it was much better than a small dorm room. Walking in, I could hear people laughing and talking from the living room. I followed the noise and met my new housemates. There was Chris, a tall guy who was very friendly and studying to be an engineer. Then there was Joe, a bit smaller but very funny, who was studying psychology. And there was Tom, who was quiet and focused on his computer science studies. They all made me feel welcome. I found out I wasn't the only new guy. Chris and Joe had also just moved in, while Tom had been there before. The first couple of weeks were awesome. We got along well, spending our days going to class and studying. At night, we'd make dinner together and watch movies. It felt like I had found a new family, which was really nice. But then things started to get weird. Chris, Joe, and I were getting along great, but Tom began to keep to himself more and more. It was rare to even see him. 
He'd stay in his room all day, only coming out quickly to get food or go to the bathroom. I'm not even sure he was going to his classes anymore. He also started to get really short-tempered, getting mad at anyone who tried to talk to him or check if he was okay. I started to be really afraid of him and tried to stay away as much as I could. This made me feel a bit better, but his strange actions were still freaking me out. Around that time, I noticed that things in my room didn't look right. I always keep my room clean and everything in its place, so it was obvious when my computer or clothes were moved. I didn't want to believe someone was going into my room without permission, so I just tried to ignore it. But then, one night, I was trying to sleep when I heard a strange noise from the hallway. I got out of bed to check and was shocked to see Tom just standing there, outside my door. He had a weird, scary look on his face. Then I saw he was holding a small knife. He didn't open it, but it was still terrifying. Suddenly, he moved towards me fast and I screamed for help, falling backward. I tripped over something and hit my head hard on something else. The next thing I knew, I woke up in a hospital where they told me Tom had tried to hurt me really badly. The doctors said I was lucky it wasn't worse. At first, I couldn't believe it. But as I remembered more, I had to accept it was true. They told me Chris heard me and managed to stop Tom and hold him until the police came. I found out Tom was taken by the police. I had to leave college and go home to get better, both in my body and my head. It's been a tough journey, but I'm starting to feel a bit better now. Looking back, I realized there were signs something was wrong, but I didn't want to think a friend could do something so horrible. It was a tough lesson, but one I'll never forget. I've learned that sometimes people we think we know can do terrible things. I went back to college in a new city and met new people to live with. I was scared at first, but my new housemates turned out to be really nice and became my good friends. I'm thankful for them and for having another chance at college. I still have bad dreams about what happened, but I'm trying to deal with my fear and keep going. This story is about a scary event that happened to me. Now I am 28 years old, but this occurred roughly five years back. The whole thing began when I decided to sell my laptop on Facebook Marketplace. The laptop was a good one, only a year old and still in great shape. I thought someone would be happy to buy it at a decent price. I was going through some hard financial times, but I don't want to go into those details. That's the reason I chose to sell it and stick with my old laptop for a bit longer. Someone messaged me showing interest in buying it. They offered a bit more money than I was asking for. Looking back, that should have warned me, but I overlooked it. I really needed the cash, so I went for it. We agreed to meet in a grocery store parking lot not far from where I lived. I was happy about the chance to sell the laptop quickly. I grabbed my phone and left my apartment, walking towards the parking lot. It was a nice summer evening around 7 p.m. The sun was getting low, and I knew it would be dark soon. I hoped to finish the deal before nightfall. Reaching the parking lot, I saw a few people around the store, but didn't pay much attention to them. My focus was on spotting the buyer to get the sale done. After a bit, I noticed a guy standing by a car in a distant part of the lot. I headed his way with my laptop. As I approached, he signaled to me, showing he was the one. He was a tall, strong-looking guy with a beard that needed shaving and a serious face. A feeling of worry hit me, but I tried to shake it off. I was there to sell my computer, after all. I showed him the laptop. He asked about how well it worked and its features, then wanted me to unlock it to check if it really worked. Then I gave him the laptop, and he handed me the money. While I was counting it, he suddenly grabbed my wrist hard and twisted my arm back. I yelled because it hurt a lot and tried to get away, but he was much stronger. He then took out a knife from his pocket and put it close to my neck. Don't move, he said in a low voice. Just give back the money and pretend this never happened. I was so scared. I had never faced something like this and didn't know how to react. I quickly gave him the money back and he stepped back but still had the knife out. His face showed no feeling. It seemed like he did this kind of thing all the time, and it was normal for him. Then he ran off. I just stood there, watching him go, and couldn't believe what just happened. I realized he had stolen from me. It was hard to believe. My hands were shaking and my heart was beating fast as I took out my phone to call the cops. They got there in a little while, 
and I described the man and said he ran away. They said they would try to find him, but that didn't make me feel much better. The rest of the day, I felt lost and confused, as if it wasn't real. I went back to my place but couldn't keep still. I walked around, trying to understand the situation. I was mad, frightened, and felt very upset. I had never felt so weak and exposed. The cops never found the man who took my things. My laptop was gone for good. And of course, his profile was nowhere to be found later. Thinking back, I realize I could have checked his profile to see if he was real. That's a good thing about selling on Facebook Marketplace compared to other places like Craigslist. You can look at their profiles and avoid the dangerous ones. I didn't do that, and this is what happened. This all happened around eight years ago, back when I was just hitting my mid-twenties. One day, while wasting time on Facebook, I stumbled upon a friend request from someone I didn't know at all. Their profile picture was nothing but a shadow. Their name didn't ring any bells for me. Normally I wouldn't add strangers, but something about this person sparked my curiosity. So I accepted their request and we began to talk. This person, who went by the name Jake, was easy to talk to and seemed nice in the beginning. He was curious about what I did and what I liked. We found out we both really liked music. I started to enjoy our talks a lot and looked forward to them. Jake seemed to really care about what I had to say, which made me like talking to him even more. But then, things started to get weird when Jake began asking very personal questions. He wanted to know exactly where I lived, what my daily routine was, and he even made comments on my pictures and what I posted. I began to feel uneasy and thought it was best to stop talking to him. That's when things got really scary. Jake wouldn't stop messaging me, day and night, wondering why I wasn't answering. When I ignored him, his messages got creepier, and he even mentioned the cafe where I worked, a detail I was sure I had never shared with him. I became really scared and thought I should go to the police for help, but they told me there wasn't much they could do since all our interactions were online, and there was no way to tell if Jake was even in the same country as me. I felt trapped and scared, not knowing what to do. Then Jake started leaving frightening voicemails and even threatened to come to my home. I was completely terrified and felt like someone was always watching me. This mess all started from connecting with someone I never met face to face. He didn't have a real photo online. Anyone I passed by could have been him, and I wouldn't have a clue. My fear kept growing, and I began to sleep with all the lights on in my room. Every night, I made sure all the doors and windows were locked tight. I couldn't help but look around me all the time. What used to be a normal, happy life turned into days filled with worry and nights filled with dread. Then one day, Jake sent me a message that chilled me to the bone. He said he knew exactly where I was and that I couldn't hide from him. That scared me enough to call the police again, and this time, they actually listened. It seemed like they finally took it seriously when Jake threatened to find me in person. I don't understand why they didn't help me the first time. Later, the police got back to me. They had talked to Jake and warned him to stay away from me. After that warning, Jake stopped messaging me. But the fear he caused stayed with me for a long, long time. I still use Facebook and other social media, but I'm very careful about who I let into my life now. I've learned it's important to listen to your gut feeling. The internet can connect you with great people, but it can also be a place where danger hides.